So, ich würde sagen, wir starten jetzt mal. Ich hoffe, ihr könnt mich alle gut verstehen. Ich heiße euch herzlich willkommen. Ich bin Eva, ich bin auch im AStA von der Uni Hamburg und studiere aber an der HW Umwelttechnik und ja, freue mich, dass ihr heute alle wieder so zahlreich hier seid. Wie schon letzte Woche angekündigt, werden wir jetzt heute am Anfang ein bisschen nochmal was Organisatorisches erklären. Dazu werde ich gleich erstmal an Benny übergeben, der euch... Ja, ein bisschen was zu den Tests erklären wird, weil, ähm, wie ihr hoffentlich alle wisst, heute nach der Vorlesung um 21 Uhr ähm, die Tests online gehen, ähm, die ihr, genau, ja, äh, bearbeiten müsst, um äh, letztendlich die Credit Points zu bekommen. Ähm, ja, genau. Äh, vielleicht noch eine andere kurze Info. Wir hatten letzte Woche angekündigt, dass wir einen, also als Fridays for Future ähm, noch einen Vortrag ähm, halten werden. Der sollte eigentlich diesen Donnerstag stattfinden um 17 Uhr. Ähm, der ist nicht irgendwie prüfungsrelevant oder so, aber ihr seid äh, natürlich, also eigentlich alle gerne dazu eingeladen. Ähm, leider muss dieser Vortrag aber verschoben werden. Ähm, Wahrscheinlich äh, in den nächsten zwei Wochen wird der stattfinden. Wir geben euch dann nochmal Bescheid. Äh, ihr könnt natürlich trotzdem schon irgendwie in die Infogruppen ähm, kommen und da ja schon vorab irgendwie ein paar Infos bekommen. Und äh, genau, ich glaube, jetzt gebe ich erstmal an Benny weiter. Und äh, ja, schön, dass ihr alle da seid. Ja, moin auch äh, von meiner Seite. Schön, dass ihr wieder alle da seid. Ich darf euch jetzt ein bisschen was zu den Online-Tests erzählen. Da brennen euch sicher schon die Fragen unter den Fingernägeln. Ähm, genau, vorab, wie ihr sicherlich wisst, wird unsere Vorlesung nicht nur an der Uni Hamburg, sondern auch an der HW angeboten. Dementsprechend richtet sich auch die folgende Einführung an Studierende beider Hochschulen. Jetzt fragt ihr euch sicherlich, woher weiß ich denn, welche Informationen aus dem ganzen Boost für mich relevant sind. Dazu haben wir uns was ausgedacht, und zwar geben die Balken am Folienrand, das werdet ihr gleich sehen, Auskunft darüber, für wen die jeweiligen Inhalte von Interesse sind. Seht ihr lediglich einen blauen Balken an der Seite, dann sind die Informationen relevant nur für Studierende der HAB. Ist der Balken rot, dann sind die Informationen nur für Studierende der Uni Hamburg wichtig. Und sind der, ist der Balken rot und blau, dann sind die Informationen für Studierende beider Hochschulen von Bedeutung. Rufen wir uns einmal ganz kurz in Erinnerung, was wir schon in der ersten Sitzung euch mitgeteilt haben. Insgesamt müsst ihr zum Bestehen des Kurses und um die vier bzw. zweieinhalb Leistungspunkte angerechnet zu bekommen, vier Tests absolvieren. Pro Test gibt es ca. 30 bis 40 Punkte zu erreichen, wobei Abweichungen jederzeit möglich sind. Die Tests starten in der Regel dienstags um 20 Uhr, jeweils nach Ende der Vorlesungszeit. Die einzige Ausnahme bildet der heutige erste Online-Test, der erst um 21 Uhr starten wird. Anschließend habt ihr sieben Tage, jeweils bis dienstags vor Beginn der nächsten Vorlesungszeit, die Möglichkeit, diese Tests zu bearbeiten. Sobald ihr die Tests einmal gestartet habt, habt ihr kein Zeitlimit, in, deren, in dem ihr den Test abgeben müsst. Die einzelnen Online-Tests beziehen sich jeweils auf drei bis vier Vorlesungen. Ähm, die genauen Testzeiträume könnt ihr den Kalendern auf Opolat oder Emil entnehmen. Pro Test habt ihr zwei Versuche. Der erste für bestandene Versuch wird aber jedoch gewertet und ein Test gilt als bestanden, sobald mehr oder mindestens 50 Prozent der Fragen richtig beantwortet werden. Es startet. Ähm, achtet darauf, dass ihr gerade eine stabile Internetverbindung Sobald der Testzeitraum gestartet ist, also heute 21 Uhr, werdet ihr auf OpenOLAT am linken Bildschirmrand den ersten Test sehen und könnt dort unten auf Starten klicken. Sobald ihr das gemacht habt, geht der Test automatisch los und euch wird die Frage angezeigt. Am linken Bildschirmrand seht ihr die einzelnen Sektionen, die werden bei den einzelnen Tests dann heute zum Beispiel erste Vorlesung und zweite Vorlesung heißen und darunter hier im Falle Klimaaktivisten und Fridays for Future seht ihr die Namen der einzelnen Fragen und könnt euch an der Seite auch einfach durchklicken. In der Mitte seht ihr die Frage, bei der nicht nur die Fragestellung, sondern auch quasi der Auftrag oder was ihr machen sollt, näher geschildert wird. In diesem Fall handelt es sich um eine Multiple-Choice-Aufgabe, das heißt, ihr müsst einfach die Kästchen anklicken und ähm, ja, sagen, was eurer Meinung nach richtig ist. Ihr könnt den Test jederzeit unterbrechen 
und eure Antworten werden zwischengespeichert. Wir empfehlen euch zwar, alles in einem Rutsch zu machen, um euch besser konzentrieren zu können und nicht so schnell den Faden zu verlieren. Falls es aber doch mal einen Notfall geben sollte und ihr den Test unterbrechen möchtet, dann klickt oben auf Test unterbrechen. Eure Antworten werden zwischengespeichert und ihr könnt zu einem späteren Zeitpunkt den Test fortsetzen. Sobald ihr eine Frage eurer Meinung nach richtig beantwortet habt, müsst ihr zwangsläufig unten auf Antwort speichern klicken. Wenn ihr das getan habt, wird eure Antwort gespeichert und ihr werdet automatisch zur nächsten Frage weitergeleitet. Ihr seht dann am linken Bildschirmrand die Frage, die ihr beantwortet habt, wird mit einem grünen Häkchen markiert und die Fortschrittsleiste am oberen Bildschirmrand wandert weiter. Sobald ihr alle Fragen beantwortet habt, also sobald alle Fragen mit einem grünen Häkchen, Häkchen markiert sind, ähm, dann müsst ihr oben rechts auf Test beenden klicken. Dann werdet ihr nochmal aufgefordert, das Ganze mit OK zu bestätigen. Und sobald ihr das getan habt, wird euer Test abgeschickt und ihr erhaltet automatisch und sofort ein Feedback, ob ihr mindestens 50% der, der Punkte in Test 1 erreicht habt. Ist das der Fall, dann sieht das Ganze so aus und dann könnt ihr euch für den Rest der Woche frei nehmen. Ist das Ganze nicht der Fall, dann sieht das so aus. Das heißt, wenn ihr weniger als 50% der Punkte erreicht habt, dann könnt ihr versuchen, dieses Ergebnis zu verbessern, indem ihr euren Zweitversuch wahrnehmt. So viel zur Bearbeitung auf OpenOLAT. Folgenden gehe ich auf E-Mail ein. Das Ganze ist also relevant jetzt für Studierende der HW. Die Anmeldung zu den Online-Tests sieht an der HW etwas anders aus. Wir haben vor einigen Tagen auf E-Mail schon eine erste Ankündigung online gestellt. Ich sage es an dieser Stelle nochmal. Es ist sehr wichtig. Dass ihr, euer, dass ihr an der Umfrage Anmeldung zu Prüfungen auf E-Mail teilnehmt. Das könnt ihr bis zum 26.04. um 12 Uhr machen. Jeden Tag um 12 Uhr werden wir schauen, wer an dieser Abstimmung teilgenommen hat und alle, die neu dabei sind und an den Prüfungen frei äh, teilnehmen möchten, werden dann dafür freigeschaltet von uns. Das Ganze sieht so aus. Ihr müsst unten einfach nur ankreuzen, ich möchte an den Prüfungen teilnehmen und dann schalten wir euch dafür frei. Ähm, Wer nicht an der Umfrage teilnimmt, das müssen wir an dieser Stelle nochmal ganz eindeutig sagen, dem werden die Testinhalte nicht zur Verfügung stehen. Wenn ihr also die zweieinhalb Leistungspunkte am Ende des Semesters äh, erlangen möchtet, dann müsst ihr bis Mitte nächster Woche an dieser Umfrage teilnehmen. Wenn ihr nicht daran teilnimmt, dann seht ihr das, ähm, dann wird auf E-Mail dieser Hinweis eingeblendet, ähm, dass der Test für euch eingeschränkt und nicht verfügbar ist. Ähm, genau. Und Zusätzlich wird zu einem späteren Zeitpunkt im Semester eine Prüfungsanmeldung über MyHW notwendig sein. Zum gegenwärtigen Zeitpunkt ähm, könnt ihr euch über MyHW noch nicht anmelden. Wir informieren euch aber sofort, sobald die Anmeldung freigeschaltet ist. Letzter wichtiger Hinweis zur Anmeldung und äh, zur Anrechnung der Tests. Klärt bitte möglichst bald mit eurer Studiengangsleitung ab, ob ihr euch die Vorlesung anrechnen lassen könnt. Das ist nämlich nicht in jedem Studiengang leider gewährleistet. Habt ihr euch für die Prüfung angemeldet und ist der Testzeitraum gestartet, ähm, dann sieht es auf E-Mail so aus. Da müsst ihr einfach nur auf Erster Online-Test klicken und ähm, anschließend am unteren Bildschirmrand auf äh, Test jetzt durchführen. Und dann werdet ihr, genau wie bei OpenOLAT, automatisch zu den Fragen weitergeleitet. Ähm, bei E-Mail ist es so, dass euch die Fragen alle auf einem Bildschirm äh, aufgelistet werden. Das heißt, ihr müsst euch nicht einzeln durchklicken, sondern ihr könnt einfach nach unten scrollen. Am rechten Bildschirmrand bei Testnavigation seht ihr, aus vielen, wie vielen Fragen der Test besteht und könnt euch dort bequem durchklicken. Am linken Rand mh, seht ihr, ob ihr eine Aufgabe schon beantwortet habt und wie viele Punkte es dafür gibt. Und ähm, sobald ihr eure Antworten ausgewählt habt, ähm, sieht es bei euch so aus. Indem ihr auf meine Auswahl wiederrufen klickt, könnt ihr eine Frage erneut beantworten, wenn ihr euch unsicher seid. Wenn ihr alle Fragen am Ende bearbeitet habt, müsst ihr unten auf Versuch beenden klicken. Der nächste Bildschirm sieht folgendermaßen aus. Dort ist es wichtig, dass ihr noch einmal auf Abgabe, Abgabe klickt und das folgende Bestätigungsfenster noch einmal mit Abgabe bestätigt. Anschließend erhaltet ihr ebenfalls ein sofortiges Feedback darüber, ob ihr mindestens die Hälfte der möglichen Punktzahl oder weniger der möglichen Punktzahl erreicht habt. Ähm, solltet ihr weniger als die Hälfte der, der Punkte erreicht haben, ähm, könnt ihr genau wie Studierende der Uni Hamburg auch äh, einen Zweitversuch unternehmen. Dazu geht ihr auf die erste Seite zurück, wo ihr auch den Test gestartet habt und klickt unten auf Test wiederholen. So viel zur Bedienung der Tests. Im Folgenden kommen wir noch zur Bewertung und Ergebnissen. 
Nach Ablauf jeder Testphase, also der einwöchigen, des einwöchigen Testzeitraums, sind sowohl in OpenOLAT als auch in EMIL die detaillierten Ergebnisse für 24 Stunden einsehbar. Detaillierte Ergebnisse heißt, es wird angezeigt, ob ihr über oder unter 50 Prozent der Punkte im Test erreicht habt. Gleichzeitig könnt ihr eure Punktzahl einsehen sowie eure Antworten mit den Musterlösungen vergleichen. Wichtige Stelle auch noch mal an dieser, an dieser Stelle, wichtiger Hinweis noch mal an dieser Stelle, wir hatten das auch in der ersten Sitzung schon einmal anklingen lassen. Es ist nicht wichtig, dass ihr in jedem Test und in jedem äh, Online-Test mindestens 50 Prozent der Punkte erreicht, sondern vielmehr ist entscheidend, dass ihr am Ende in allen vier Tests insgesamt die, Maximalpunkt, die Hälfte der Maximalpunktzahl erreicht habt. Das Beispiel seht ihr unten, wenn man im Test 1 beispielsweise 8 von 18 Punkten erreicht hat, wären das weniger als 50 Prozent. Wenn ihr im darauffolgenden Test aber beispielsweise 18 von 22 Punkten erlangt, dann habt ihr insgesamt mehr als 50 Prozent aller möglichen Punkte erreicht und hättet damit den Kurs bestanden und könntet euch die Leistungspunkte anrechnen lassen. In einigen Wochen, nachdem der vierte Online-Test abgelaufen ist, ähm, werden wir die Ergebnisse veröffentlichen. Das sieht folgendermaßen aus. Und zwar wird es einen Bearbeitungszeitraum auf unserer Seite von bis zu zwei Wochen geben. Das kann sehr viel schneller gehen. Es kann aber auch bis zu zwei Wochen dauern. Und anschließend werden eure Gesamtergebnisse ausgewertet und dann auf Stine bzw. MyHW eingetragen. In der Zeit möchten wir euch bitten, von individuellen Anfragen abzusehen. Wir werden euch die Ergebnisse möglichst frühzeitig zur Verfügung stehen und anschließend könnt ihr euch mit Fragen jederzeit an uns wenden. Wir werden, sobald die Ergebnisse eingetragen sind, auch nochmal eine Mail an alle Studierenden rumschicken und dann könnt ihr jeweils in euer Leistungskonto sehen, ob ihr bestanden habt oder nicht bestanden habt. Wenn ihr über 50 Prozent der Punkte erreicht habt, dann habt ihr die Veranstaltung erfolgreich absolviert. Wenn ihr aber weniger als 50 Prozent der Gesamtpunkte erreicht habt, dann gibt es die Möglichkeit, an einem Nachschreibetermin teilzunehmen. Ähm, der sieht dann folgendermaßen aus, dass ihr zwei Stunden, dass ihr zu einem bestimmten Zeitpunkt auf OpenOLAT oder Emil ein Test für zwei Stunden freigeschaltet wird. Ähm, in dieser Zeit habt ihr die Möglichkeit, die dort gestellten Fragen zu beantworten. Und wenn ihr in diesem Nachschreibetermin 50 Prozent der Punkte erreicht, dann habt ihr ebenfalls bestanden. Wann genau diese Nachschreibeklausur stattfinden wird, das geben wir noch bekannt. Ähm, und dann müsst ihr euch über MyHW oder Stina rechtzeitig dafür anmelden. Wir werden euch darüber aber frühzeitig informieren, habt keine Sorge in der Hinsicht. Genau. Wie bereitet man sich jetzt am besten auf so einen Test vor? Natürlich, man guckt sich die, die Vorlesung an, macht sich fleißig Notizen, aber ebenfalls lädt, ladet ihr euch am besten die Unterlagen, beispielsweise Vorlesungsfolien oder zusätzliche Literatur, vor Testbeginn herunter. Ähm, damit ihr nicht während des Tests nochmal auf OpenOLAT oder E-Mail Dinge öffnen müsst. Ähm, das funktioniert nämlich meistens nicht und führt zu Problemen. Stellt, wie gesagt, sicher, dass ihr eine stabile Internetverbindung habt und sucht euch für den Test am besten einen Zeitpunkt aus, an dem ihr in Ruhe längere Zeit arbeiten könnt. Idealerweise bearbeitet ihr den Test in einem Durchgang. Wie gesagt, falls doch mal ein Notfall dazwischen kommt, dann könnt ihr zumindest auf OpenOLAT den Test unterbrechen. Ihr solltet aber nicht einfach den Test offen lassen und dann für längere Zeiträume einfach mal den Computer so stehen lassen. Wenn ihr wirklich gerade mal weg müsst, dann unterbrecht den Test auf jeden Fall und speichert ihn zwischen. Und immer daran denken, wenn ihr den Test beendet habt, dann gebt ihn rechtzeitig ab. Falls ihr nicht rechtzeitig vor Testende den Test abgeschickt haben solltet, wäre das aber auch kein großes Problem, dann können wir den manuell einziehen. Trotzdem Achtet darauf, euch genügend Zeit zu nehmen und rechtzeitig den Test äh, zu beenden. Wir wünschen euch ganz viel Erfolg, gerade heute Abend bei dem ersten Test. Ähm, schickt uns gerne Feedback, falls es irgendwie zu Problemen kommen sollte auf eurer Seite. Solltet ihr zwischendurch doch nochmal Fragen haben, dann schaut gerne erstmal auf OpenOLAT und auf E-Mail, ob ihr dort die relevanten Informationen beispielsweise im FAQ findet. Fragt irgendwie eure Mitstudierenden, vielleicht könnt ihr euch helfen. Und Falls das alles nicht hilft, dann schreibt uns äh, gerne eine E-Mail an eine der beiden E-Mail-Adressen. Ja, so viel von meiner Seite. Ich wünsche euch ganz viel Erfolg und drücke euch die Daumen, dass das alles klappt äh, und gebe damit jetzt wieder zurück an Eva. Ja, vielen Dank, Benny. Äh, genau, wie gesagt, wenn noch Fragen offen sind, dann äh, könnt ihr euch auch gerne sonst über das, den Chat oder über das Q&A ähm, melden. 
Und genau, ich glaube, das solltet ihr alle eigentlich inzwischen auch mitbekommen haben, aber der ähm, Vortrag heute wird auf Englisch sein. Das heißt, ich äh, switche jetzt auch mal zu Englisch. Ähm, und ja. <lacht> um, so, uh, we're going to start with the lecture now, and I'm very grateful to welcome uh, Julia Steinberger today to our lecture series. Uh, she's a professor on social sciences of climate change at the University of Lausanne. She works in the field of um, eco ecological economics and has a PhD in physics, as she says, from a long time ago. Um, right now, she's working on... Um, the IPCC's sixth assessment report in working group number three. And yeah, we're really grateful to have you here right now. Um, also, since we know that you're quite busy and uh, thanks a lot. And yeah, now it's your turn. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, and uh, I'm very impressed by the, the, the infrastructure and so many people on the call. And uh, I hope that this will be an interesting preparation for your big exam, I guess, uh, at least. So I'm just going to start sharing screens and we'll go into the talk. Um, I uh, And I hope it will be interesting to you. So I don't know the level of everybody. So I figured I would just start with a very basic basic introduction and then ramp up into, into my research. Um, so I've changed the title a little, little bit. I'm allowing myself to do that, but it's about climate action and human prosperity. And this research area is um, uh, living, what I call living well within limits or living well within planetary limits. Um, so I'll tell you a bit about the Living Well Within Limits project. I'll tell you about our motivation, uh, some of our recent results. And then what does that mean in terms of how we move forward together? So um, the context of climate change is known, but it is the motivation of, uh, of what we do. And this is a photograph of the town of Vizubi in France nearby uh, to where I live right now, which is in, in Switzerland, uh, which was pretty much um, destroyed by flooding this uh, past fall. And you can see the, the real violence of that. And this is something un we're seeing a lot of unprecedented um, event, climate related events in our region as well. So the scientific basis for the climate emergency. So I'm an IPCC author, but the report I'm working on is not out yet. Uh, so the report that's public is the special report on 1.5 degrees. Uh, so let's, let's look at that. Um, there have been other special reports since then, but this, this one was very um, uh, broad and, and uh, important. So the context of that report was that the Paris Agreement aims to keep warming below two degrees with 1.5 degrees as a goal. And that's really confusing because uh, maybe two degrees of warming would already be too dangerous. And as a result, governments uh, demanded um, from the IPCC a report on what is this difference in this Paris Agreement that they agreed to between this range of two and 1.5 degrees. And uh, the main thing to, to remember here is that, um, as you probably already know, when we measure these warming temperatures, we're measuring them compared to a baseline. And that baseline is the pre-industrial era. So it's before fossil fuel use, uh, coal use really started to get going. So let's say the baseline is probably something what the temperature was around let's say 1750 or 1800, something like that. Um, so this special report on 1.5 degrees compares 1.5 and two degrees of warming. And one of the basic questions to, re to, real to remember is, is to, or to think about is, what level of warming above pre-industrial are we already at? And this is a scary slide because I've had to update it on an annual basis. At last year, the temperature, the warming, global warming level that was measured was 1.2 degrees. So already very far uh, towards already 1.5 degrees. Um, and it's going up by fractions of a degree per year at this point. So, you know, a couple of years ago, we were still only um, at one degree. So things are moving quite fast in a very um, scary way, to be honest. So the, the, what this report did is it looked at impact. So for instance, if you look at uh, deadly, so these are just different categories of climate impacts. So deadly heat waves that would uh, touch human populations at least once every five years, uh, that would be 14% of the population at 1.5 degrees, 37% at two degrees. Um, so it's uh, two degrees versus 1.5 degrees is two and a half times worse. 
Um, so you see this nonlinearity. So every fraction of a degree really makes a big difference depending on the system that you're looking at. It makes a huge difference. So the Arctic free from sea ice in summer, which is a, a big change in our planetary system, would be once every 100 years at 1.5 degrees, once every 10 years at 2 degrees, so 10 times worse. Uh, insect species losing 50% of their range, that would be 6% um, at 1.5 degrees. So when, it, uh, when a species loses 50% of its geographic range, um, it becomes technically at risk of extinction. Um, and at two degrees, this would be 18%, so almost one in five, and that's three times worse. And dying coral reefs, so most of the coral reefs disappear at 1.5 degrees already, as we're seeing right now. Uh, so between 70 and 90% are expected to disappear at 1.5 degrees. At two degrees, it's uh, complete extinction. Um, and the impacts, uh, so a lot of times people, um, even just a few years ago, people would say, oh, when you're looking at climate, you're not looking at biodiversity, you need to look at both. But the fact is, we're looking at very intertwined uh, problems. So there is no way to act on biodiversity without acting on climate. And I think that this paper, uh, which was Warren et al. in Science from a couple of years ago, really, make that the, their headline results showed quite clearly. Um, that as warming goes up, the, the percentage of um, species at risk of extinction uh, really skyrocket. So at uh, 1.5 degrees of warming, vertebrates, plants, and insects, it's still below 10%. But as warming goes up, uh, you know, by the time you, you hit three degrees, uh, it's almost half of insect, all plant and insect species and a quarter of vertebrates around the world at risk of extinction by 2100. Uh, by 2100, yeah, by 2100. So it's really um, uh, quite a scary situation. And what temperature are we currently heading for in the context of the Paris Agreement? So a lot of governments have signed up to Paris Agreement, including Germany, but emissions are still increasing. And uh, we're seeing this year on year. Um, last year, there was a bit of a dip, but this year they're going to be going back up, including news that came up just today, but that I haven't had time to include in this slide. And the Paris Agreement would take us probably around three degrees. So greater than three degrees, it depends on who you who you believe. There are new, new ambitious um, targets that are set by various governments, including China, but not necessarily implemented in the five-year plan, including uh, the US just released, uh, including the UK just released today. So there are various ambitions that are out there which would take us below three degrees. Some people say maybe around 2.7. Uh, but in terms of currently, you know, legally binding, really on the way to being implemented measures, we're still heading upwards of three degrees. And we're certainly not heading to two degrees or 1.5 degrees. So despite the fact that the really important thing to understand is despite the fact that governments have signed up to the Paris Agreement, they're not doing enough. And they're not doing uh, enough to get uh, to where they agreed to go. So one of the things that results from this is that we uh, as humans have now left the Holocene. So we've, our economic activities have moved the planet into a new climate era. And so you can see the Holocene is these temperatures, you know, around zero, uh, the sort of pink band around, around zero degrees or sort of holo the Holocene temperature range. And we are now at, uh, in 2020, at 1.2 degrees, so we are well above Holocene temperature ranges already, and we're heading into a very fast, into a very um, uncertain and uh, scary future. Now, uh, one question is, who could have known where we were going? Who could have known that this is the future, you know, that people your age are being precipitated into? And um, this is a graph that was made in the year 1982, or published in the year 1982. And the question is who could possibly have known where we are now in 2020? Uh, they actually did pretty well. So in terms of carbon dioxide uh, concentrations in the atmosphere, they were pretty close in terms of temperature measured. They were too low by about a couple 0.2 degrees. They thought it would be closer to one, uh, but it's pretty good. About 40, 40 years between now and when this plot was made. And this was uh, Exxon. At the time they were not Exxon Mobil, they were Exxon. So one of the largest petroleum uh, oil and gas companies um, ever to walk the earth. And uh, they are the ones who predicted this. So why did we not act on that prediction? Well, because that report was kept internal. It was not in fact published to 
to the public. They did not share it with investors. They did not share it with politicians. They did not share it with the public, their consumers. They uh, kept it secret and it only came to light a couple of years ago. So uh, I think this is really one of the important things to realize is that we are in a future that was created for us by this industry. They knew what they were pushing us into. And that's something that I think we really need to keep at the front of our minds that we are in a future, we are being pushed into a future deliberately and we have been pushed into this future deliberately by a certain industrial and economic system. And then what does that mean for our action I think is really important to keep in mind as well. Um, so, but this is basically the motivation for my research is that we need basically from emissions growth our emissions have to sort of drop off a cliff starting right now. And uh, it would have been a lot better if they'd started a few, a few, quite a few years ago, but now is a good time to start dropping these emissions. And um, the next few years are probably the most important in our history. That's a quote from Deborah Roberts. Uh, and I think she's really, it's really important to realize that this is not just the history of us uh, as people right, live alive right now. It's probably true for the history of our species because we are pushing right now our climate into a temperature zone that our species has never known and that homogeneous has never known. So if we wanna be safe, we had better act very, very strongly right now. And the implications for my research are that we need urgent and large scale action. So radical emission reductions, um, getting to zero or really close really soon. And the fastest and surest way to do that is to reduce consumption because reducing consumption does not require much new technology or infrastructure. But to little, to date, there's very little or almost no research on how, to how consumption could be reduced while preserving or enhancing well-being. And that was really the motivation for this, is to understand how we can reduce consumption while preserving and enhancing well-being. And um, uh, this, this, this refusal to consider demand reduction was uh, summarized by uh, Kevin Anderson as saying, we really haven't tried mitigation yet. So to do this research, we need a new framework. And that's what uh, I was able to do within the Living Well Within Limits project. And our framework looks like this. Um, so this is where we're trying to understand this system, where we start from planetary processes to natural resources um, on the biophysical input side, the right-hand side of this plot. And then the social outcomes are need satisfiers and well-being, not GDP growth. We are not interested in economic growth we are interested in well-being, which has to do with physical and mental health, autonomy, cognitive understanding, life satisfaction, et cetera. And the need satisfiers are um, the, these things that you need in order to have well-being. Um, and in the middle, the interesting part is provisioning systems. So that's the whole economy, that's society, that's government, that's technology and infrastructure. Um, and we try to make sure that we're in, allowed to study these in an integrated way. So it's really important for us that you can study physical and social systems to, in, a, in, a, in an integrated way through this concept of provisioning systems. So uh, let's talk a bit about well-being because I'm a physicist. So if you know about being trained as a physicist, um, you, we don't know very much about well-being, so we have to study it academically. So, and you have to go back pretty far in time uh, and you actually have to go back and do some of this reading, or we had to, maybe now you don't have to anymore, you can read some of our papers. Um, but welcome to ancient Greece, where, uh, you know, thousands of years ago, Aristotle already in 30, 350 BC, roughly, uh, had this perspective on well-being, which he wrote about in the ethics. Uh, well-being means being able to live life as fully as possible and to flourish within one's society. It's a very social perspective on well-being. Now, uh, just you know, a few decades later, Epicure came on the scene and said, you know what, I have a different perspective. Well-being means achieving the most positive and the least negative feelings possible. So this is a much more individual and a much more balanced oriented perspective. And like all good academic disputes, the two camps persist to this day. Um, so you have to choose, you have to choose a team. And so if you're on team Epicure, uh, you have a certain perspective. And that perspective, I would say, is the dominant one today. So it's this view of well-being as happiness. It's an individualized perspective, which fits very well with our individualistic culture. Uh, you might choose to measure it through the happiness indicator. 
uh, which is measured by the UN, like how happy are you on a scale from one to 10? You can answer that question maybe. Um, or through a utility function, maximizing utility is the same as well being in economics and neoclassical economics. Um, and this perspective on growth is actually, it fits quite well with economic growth because more income translates to more consumption, translates to higher utility maximization, to more positive feelings. And so uh, there you go. Uh, team Epicure fits well with an economic growth perspective. But you could also choose to be on Team Aristotle, but it is a different team where um, well being is considered to be flourishing. It's uh, uh, not, so it's about human potential, it's not about feelings. It's a much more social perspective. You could measure it through the Human Development Index or the Sustainable Development Goals. So those perspectives are much more aligned with uh, an Aristot uh, Aristotelian view. Um, and in terms of the economy, you're actually looking at a perspective of development, which is to support human potential. So from the Aristotelian perspective, you would say that um, uh, the economy is there to support human flourishing, not just to have growth. And uh, within the Lilly project, so the Living Well with the Limits project, we decided we were the recruits on Team Aristotle. And uh, we've written a couple of papers that you are welcome to go and have a look at that sort of explain these concepts in a bit more detail. Um, and hopefully that helps explain why it's interesting and possible to research this. Now, uh, one question is if you're interested in numbers, uh, like a physicist is, or like anybody who cares about reality might be, um, you might want to test this. And so what we did is we decided to go ahead and test this um, using uh, the theory of human need of Doyle and Guff. And uh, so those are these need satisfiers. So the question that we're asking ourselves is, do need satisfiers correspond to well-being? And um, this perspective on well-being is that it's multidimensional. So these need satisfiers, there's multiple of them, but there's a finite number of them and they're non-substitutable. So, and, and also satiable. Once you satisfy one, you don't need more of the same well, human need. You, you need all of your human needs to be satisfied, but it's not like more is, of the same human need is necessarily better. So we did this uh, for, uh, internationally and we looked at countries in terms of human need satisfaction and we just put them in different bins. So you can see here on the horizontal axis, according to the number of human need satisfiers they achieved. So we sort of said, if a country achieves no human need satisfiers, we'll put it in that bin. And all the countries in that bin, we will average their life satisfaction. And we'll do that for all the need satisfiers we could measure, which was up to nine. And these were the results. And the point is that life satisfaction is definitely sort of a holistic well-being indicator. And what you can see is that there's a really, I mean, we had no expectation of the correlation being this strong, but you can see there's really strong evidence for the idea that the more human needs you satisfy, the higher your life satisfaction will be. So that is really um, backup for this idea that multidimensional need satisfaction is a precondition for well being. And for healthy life expectancy, the relationship is in some ways even stronger. Um, and it shows some saturation. So you need a certain number of need satisfiers for healthy to be healthy. And then um, after that, uh, um, the other ones are for free, basically. So we thought that at least that part of our framework was. Um, uh, we had, we had good reason to believe that this was uh, that our framework was working. So we decided to do some more research um, where we looked at whether or not uh, Kate Rayworth's donut exists internationally. So does well-being within limits exist internationally? Um, and so the idea of Kate Rayworth's donut is that we have uh, a donut, which is the good place we want to be. The donut is a just and safe space for humanity. It's within environmental ceiling, so not going beyond planetary boundaries. And um, so we're not going into zones where climate change and where we're overshooting on lots of different planetary boundaries, but it's also a place where we've achieved a lot of the social foundations. So the inner ring of Kate Rayworth's donut are these social foundations uh, where you've achieved you know, water, income, et cetera, lots of different dimensions. And uh, so we tested this and uh, we had the, the work of, of getting indicators was uh, quite difficult, uh, but we managed to do it. Uh, we translated biophysical indicators into per capita boundaries, and we also had social indicators and their thresholds. And 
uh, to just to say, show you some national results. So Germany looks like this, where it's overshooting a lot of its boundaries, uh, but it's achieved uh, all of the social foundations on average. And um, whereas a country, I think this is Sri Lanka, um, has uh, doesn't overshoot any um, planetary boundaries, but also doesn't achieve a lot of social thresholds. And these two countries are actually representative. So you can see that Germany is up there. So here we're looking at biophysical boundaries transgressed, just as so you know you can see that Germany's transgressed five biophysical boundaries out of the seven that we measure, but it's achieved eleven social thresholds, and you know Sri Lanka is down sort of here, and uh, you can you can be the worst of both worlds as well. So you can be sort of down here and achieve very few social thresholds, while transgressing a lot of biophysical boundaries. But the really empty part of this graph is where we would need to be, which in order to be safe and well, which is to achieve lots of social thresholds while not transgressing any planetary boundaries. And so then the research question becomes a lot, you know, it's kind of a depressing viewpoint is like, oh, no country is currently doing this. So the question becomes, how can we go from where we are now, which is not in a good place for any country in the world, uh, so Kate Rayworth's conclusion when she saw her study was we're all developing countries now. So how can we develop, how can we move fast from where we are now to where we need to be? Now, we know that one of the things that's going to be very important to get inside the donut is to deal with distribution and inequality. So we have these macro social factors and here you can see this large social division um, of different housing types. Uh, so we need to look at inequality. So we looked at inter and intranational inequality in energy use. This was published last year in Nature Energy, and that was our title, very descriptive title, very academic title. The BBC covered it in the news. Um, climate change, the rich are to blame international study finds, which is kind of true. Uh, so what we do here is we measure energy footprints. They're direct and indirect. We're using multi-regional input-output. Um, we're looking at different categories of products. We're looking at 86 countries in the EU and across the world through the World Bank. And we're dividing them, each of the countries into income classes. And just to show you some of the results from this study, um, these plots are known as Lorentz curves. Um, they measure, they basically are, are a graphical depiction of inequality where you have the poorest population down here and the richest population up here. And then um, if everybody were equal, you would have 100% of the population using 100% of energy, but it would all be along this curve. So this curve shows a perfectly equal society would lie along this curve. The further away from you, the, this curve of equality you are, the more unequal your distribution. And you can see that energy use is quite unequal, but that some categories of energy use are much more unequal than others. And they are all related to transport. So there's other transport, which could include public transportation. That was sort of a category we had in our database. There's a vehicle fuel. So private vehicle is very unequally distributed. And the most unequal of all is vehicle is um, package holidays, uh, which had to do with uh, flying. And uh, so you can see that we really have very unequal distribution of transportation categories. Um, we were able to map product categories. And I think this is probably the most interesting part of this study for me. It really tells us a lot of information. So when you map it, you're bas we're basically mapping it according to two dimensions. The products consumed more by poor people and the products consumed more by rich people. So more by poor people on the bottom um, and more by rich people on the top of this graph. And then on the left side of this graph, uh, sorry, on the left side of this graph, you have less energy per dollar spent, more energy per dollar spent on the right side. So um, in the upper right-hand corner, you have these luxury and high. And again, this was really amazing to us. We were not expecting this. You can see that uh, the, all of the categories in this, in this quadrant are transport categories. So it's vehicles, vehicle fuel, package holidays, various kinds of transport categories. Whereas very high energy intensity um, but consumed more by poor people. So basic but high intensity is heat and electricity. And this is basically energy used in buildings. So these are the, the kinds of things that you have. And that really gives us a sense of differentiation. So you could think that for instance, for transportation, we need to tax and regulate because 
rich people can always afford uh, to some extent to do things differently. And uh, if we don't make it more expensive, if we don't make it prohibited, they might keep uh, consuming things that are very energy intensive or environmentally damaging. Whereas if poor people are using a lot of energy and heat in buildings, we need to invest because they need to use that stuff, but they cannot pay for it themselves. So we need to invest, have some kind of mechanism for investing publicly um, uh, in uh, housing efficiency and low carbon energy sources. So those are sort of some of the, the things that we can think about. Um, I think it's really important to understand that car transport and Germany is no exception. In fact, Germany is probably one of the ruling countries in this area of overusing cars and using the wrong kind of cars, really heavy and oversized ones, um, that car transport is increasingly driving climate breakdown. So this plot from the International Energy Agency shows that the sectors that have increased um, global CO2 emissions um, in the last decade, and you can see power is huge, right? And that's what you sort of expect is electricity. A lot of it is coal-fired electricity or gas-fired electricity to be replaced with, you know, renewable energy sources, hopefully. Uh, but so power is sort of what you expect. But the second category after electricity is SUVs. It's just large cars. And if you look at other uh, um, at other cars, so other internal combustion engines, their emissions have actually gone down. So we really have this huge fraction of completely unnecessary emissions that's really pushing um, uh, climate destruction. So that's one of the things we need to realize. And uh, Tim Gore at Oxfam basically said the same things that we do. He said, governments must curb these emissions. So we need taxes and bans on luxury carbon, such as SUVs and frequent flights. Uh, with revenue recycling to public services and jobs. So that's something to think about. And um, this was also reflected in the UNEP emissions um, gap report, which had, which had an excellent chapter on inequality that really showed you know, that the top 1% um, income earners emit 15% of uh, uh, carbon emissions um, and the top 10% of population in terms of income emit almost half of total the total emissions in the world. So uh, this is really, um, inequality is obviously a huge problem, right? Uh, and that concerns a lot of people who live in the global north. Um, so as a result, we wrote, one of the things we wanted to do is reflect that when we wrote this paper, uh, Scientist Warning on Affluence, uh, which was actually one of the most downloaded and cited papers last year, as you can see, when I took this screenshot, it already had 100,000, uh, more than 100,000 people who had looked at it or downloaded it. Um, so one of the things we really wanted to point out is that this is not just a consumer choice problem. So overconsumption in our societies is designed in by states, industries, and markets. It's necessary as an outlet for economic growth. There's a lack of low consumption alternatives, and we also have a lot of advertising that's sort of pushing it. Positional consumption is another way this happens. So the affluent, the richest people in society, um, who are also the owners of, they're also the ones who benefit from the system that has economic growth, since as we know, economic growth goes, goes to the wealthiest. So the affluent drive consumption also through norms and aspirations. So we're also looking up to celebrity culture, looking up to Elon Musk who wants to build a Mars colony or whatever. So we have this sort of aspiration towards consumption. We're really, that, that, that's communicated very strongly through various kinds of media. And uh, another thing that drives overconsumption is in, in an unequal society, households consume as a way to save time, as a, a way to be convenient, as a way to, uh, for convenience within families, as a way to be competitive at work. You know, if you have a car, if you have a, if you have a family and you wanna be competitive at your work, you need to be able to drive things, drive around and do stuff. Uh, so you're saving time. You're you, you have things that sort of push you into this overconsumption trap as well in various ways. And uh, we came up with various meta approaches. Obviously you can't read this, but the article is public, but just to say that we sort of looked through what different kinds of radical approaches like eco-socialism or eco-anarchism would recommend in terms of actions and uh, policies and what re re reformist approaches would look like, like a growth or green growth approaches. And I just recommend that you have a look at those or we can talk about them more in, qu in questions um, if you're interested in that, because I think that that's um, uh, an interesting um, topic. Uh, 
And uh, in terms of alignment with current interests, obviously the one that has like the, that is dominant right now is we live in a green growth oriented um, culture and most policies aim to green growth rather than the other reformist or radical approaches. Um, okay, so then there was a question, what happens, we wondered, if you make distribution more equal? So inequality in resource use comes from inequality in income. So uh, Yannick Oswald, who's also the, the, the author on the, on the paper on, um, on measuring inequality, made this model where he basically redistributed income. So he came up with a way, you, you, you start with income distribution, you redistribute expenditure, and then you estimate what the final energy footprints look like. And I'm not going to go into it in a huge amount of detail, but the point is, if you make our, our economies, if you squeeze our economies from where they are now, which is quite unequal, so you can see this curve in the distribution of global GDP per capita, and you squeeze it all the way down to this blue, blue curve, which is very, very equal, um, global energy goes up by less than 7%. So that was, really interesting to us because a lot of, I think a lot of people assume that if we make the world more equal, there's going to be a lot more energy use, but actually that's not the case. It does go up, but it doesn't go up, you know, by less than 10%. So that's not a huge amount. Um, but what's really interesting is what changes in terms of the type of energy use. So the energy that's consumed shifts from cars to dwellings as you go to a more equal world. So if, you're, if your economy is very, uh, is very equal, um, am I gonna get this right? Yeah, if your economy is very equal, you have a lot of energy use in buildings, which is this heat and electricity orange sector. As it gets more unequal, this pink segment of transport starts to be very high. And you can see the energy profiles of a low consumer and a mega consumer. Again, you have more on dwellings um, with your, for the low energy users and more on transport for the mega consumers. So that's something that is really interesting and it caused Yannick to basically um, come to the conclusion that based on this kind of model, a more equal world would actually be easier to decarbonize because the building sector is easier to decarbonize than the transport sector. So even though more equal world means more energy use, that kind of energy use is an energy use that we can decarbonize rather easily. And so if you're interested in this argument, I would recommend to go and look at this article, uh, this commentary he published in the conversation uh, just um, a few weeks ago. Uh, and the con conclusion is basically, if we wanna decarbonize, we should prioritize needs and make those universally available rather than greeds. Um, so I'm just gonna look at the time right now I've been talking for a little while, so I am going to skip this part and we can talk about it later, but it's just not going to uh, be, it's just going to take a bit more time and confuse you and it's not so, um, yeah, we can talk about it if you want a bit. So what we wanted to do then is we wanted to model a low, what a low energy and high well-being future could look like. And I believe that this is a streetscape in Montreal, obviously pre-pandemic and let's hope they get back to it soon once everybody is vaccinated. So um, can we model a different future? So we do this based on the decent living energy framework of Professor Narasimha Rao of Yale. So I want to give him full credit for this framework. Uh, what we do is we connect needs to sufficiency levels of energy services. So we take human needs and we say, okay, how much, how much energy service do you need? Not how much energy do you need, how much energy service in terms of warm floor space or comfortable environment or lighting, uh, so illumination or nutrition. Um, so what levels of energy services do you need to be comfortable? And um, then what we do in terms of our global model, it takes into account technology improvements, equal distribution, lower demand levels. It also takes into account um, demog demography and climate and geography. So we have different levels of demand for urban and rural places. We have different levels of demand depending on the household demographics. We have different levels of demand um, depending on, um, what's, the, what's the other one besides climate demographic? Oh yeah, depending on uh, heat, but whether or not um, the climate is warmer or cold. Uh, so we take that into account. And uh, we also take into account a certain, certain warming projections. 
And so our model sort of looks like this. We have our decent living standards requirements that translate to certain levels of personal consumption, um, which have both direct and indirect and sort of embodied energy in them. There's public consumption, hospitals and schools are obviously very important for health and education. There's freight and retail because you need to consume stuff. So you have a, a sort of infrastructure that uh, allows that. And you also have just plain infrastructure like houses, transportation networks, and all of that stuff, including ICT and data centers. And what the results look like are pretty astounding. So when we, when we do this model, we find that, um, so we called it the decent living energy model. The, the, the decent living energy goes down to, um, by 2050, would be 40% of what it is now. So less than half. And if you compare that with, so this is our current energy, final energy use. These are the international energy agency scenarios. And you can see that they either go up or stay relatively stable. Uh, this is for two degrees. This is the yellow one is from beyond below two degrees. Um, and our model goes well below those. So it's obviously a very idealized model with a lot of equity and a lot of technological improvements. Um, but it's still really interesting to us that in theory with technological improvements that go towards efficient and sufficient consumption, you can actually reduce energy, energy demand by a lot uh, fast, right? Um, but, um, and, and everybody will still be okay. Everybody is protected. Nobody is living in poverty, in material poverty in this model. So the question becomes, if we think about it this way, a good life for all within planetary boundaries might be technically possible, but what is standing in our way? And um, what's standing in our way is effectively the economy, the political economy that we're in. And that's another study that we did. So I'll just tell you about it um, briefly. We looked at provisioning systems. So we looked at these social and technical provisioning system for cars. And we decided that car dependence was the real product here. Uh, we looked at five different aspects of car dependence, the automotive industry, uh, infrastructure for cars, so roads and parking, land use for cars, that's how we build our cities, how we zone our housing, neglect for public transportation, which is very important in a lot of places in the world. So you, you have the mounting of, of, the, of car dependence as, as the same time as you're taking away public transport capacity, and car culture, which is how the automotive, um, how car dependence has shaped the way we think about ourselves and, um, and our lives, you know, so that we think about our lives connected to cars a lot more than we used to. I recommend you look at the paper if you're interested. Uh, we were able to sort of map out the interlinkages between the sectors. So we called it a political anatomy of carbon lock-in really. So we're looking at these five sectors and sort of how one affects the other. Uh, you're obviously not gonna be able to read the table, but you can think about it, you know, this example is quite simple. Car infrastructure enables, when you build more car infrastructure, you're enabling the sale of more cars. You're providing more space to accommodate them. The status of roads and cars goes up. Your car has more value because parking is built, because roads are built, et cetera. And it drives out other modes. So it, car infrastructure really helps uh, the automotive sector. Whereas the automotive industry, for instance, plays a key role in lobbying coalitions, which pressure the government to invest resources in roads and, um, you know, so you, you can see this sort of multi mutual help going on here. Okay, so that was a bit of a survey of uh, the kinds of research we do. Um, now, what do we do with this kind of research? What do we do with this kind of knowledge? Why am I talking to you? Why do we do any of this? Because we need to act. And I think that our action has to be based on understanding. So in my view, the urgency of the climate situation does not allow for gradual transitions. Maybe those would have been possible starting 40 years ago when Exxon wrote their report. They're not possible now. Uh, we really need radical transformation. We need to act as fast as we can. Um, I think popular movements like the Fridays for Future, like the Sunrise Movement, um, like Extinction Rebellion in the UK, I believe realize this. And one of the questions I ask myself is, is our research supporting them? Or if you're part of these movements, is my research, is our research, is the IPCC or whoever supporting you? How can we contribute to this and how can we participate? Um, I believe that it's important to go from analysis to rebellion. Um, I'm part of many, I'm a signatory or in some case initiator to many different um, initiatives 
that support of scientists who support activist movements. So I think that's really important. If you wanna talk about that, I'm happy to as well. I do believe that the scientists, scientists who alert the world to the climate and ecological crises have a moral duty to join popular movements demanding political action. I do not think we should just sit back and write papers and um, maybe that's a good place to end it. So thank you very much. <clears throat> yeah, thank you so much for a very enthusi enthusiastic and inspiring talk and especially for the empowering ending of it, which um, shows us very clearly that, um, of course, we can all do something, be it as scientists or activists or even scholar activists. Um, that was very inspiring. And I guess we're all very, very happy uh, to have you here. And um, in the meantime, while you've been talking, lots and lots of, of people are already saying uh, thanks um, in the chat. And we all also got a, got a large number of questions ahead. Um, and um, yeah, I'll still encourage everybody here in the room to um, come up with some more questions. And in the meantime, I'll um, already start with a, with a Q&A. And we have a large bunch of, bunch of questions, some more related to facts and figures, others more related to discussion, and some also related to the more activist issues of the science policy rebellion interface. All right, so where do you want to start? Um, I think I'll just, um, just give me one second. I'll just um, go through, go through um, our chat. Yeah, I think maybe maybe I'll start maybe I'll start start right right at the end um, as you reminded us um, so um, so strongly that we should uh, reflect on how science and activism can go together. Um, would be just great if you could say a few more words about that. What motivates you and how you bridge the gap between science and activism, and how you and uh, what your experiences doing this this struggle have been. Okay, so yeah, I think it's a really important question and, uh, and I'm answering it for myself. So I don't speak for anybody else. I don't speak for the IPCC or my university or anything. I just do it myself, right? Um, but I think for me, it's very important because I have right now, I have a secure, you know, if I don't do it, who else is going to do it? Because I have a secure job, right? A lot of people don't. Um, and I have a certain visibility. Other people might be at the beginning of their careers. So I think it's really important for senior people, for people in the public, in some ways in the public eye, um, to take part in these actions because I think it gives protection. And one of the things I did recently is I co-authored a letter saying against the criminalization of climate protests. So part of the reason for doing it is protection. And uh, I have to say, I've had a lot of, um, you know, we live in difficult times. I mean, I, I'm, my life is not materially difficult, but like, you know, I'm also American. I saw Trump get elected. We see the horrors that he did. And when I when he got elected, I felt like I couldn't go into the classroom in the same way because I couldn't teach students about scientific facts in a post-truth world. Like I need to teach my students about the real world that they're going into. And so that changed things a lot for me. And um, one of the things that really made me think about is, is my work, are, is my work, are my words and are my actions protecting my students or not? And for me, it really seems like through activism, I protect my students. Uh, they might not all agree with my activism, but a lot of them are activists and a lot of them are facing, you know, are doing nonviolent civil disobedience. If, if I don't speak up for them, I am letting them down at a very basic level. So I really feel like that's one of the things that, um, that, that motivates me to be, to try to be outspoken is to think about, okay, how do I protect my students? You know, that's also one of the things that's, uh, that's very important to me. In terms of how my colleagues respond, a lot of them have been raised in this idea that, oh, a scientist is an impartial observer who writes papers and that's it. And we're not supposed to do anything else. And it's like, no, we have roles as, as citizens. We have roles as people, as human beings. And I don't know how to divide up these roles. I am a person who knows things and researches things and wants the world to change. And I'm not, 
I'm not having a very easy time saying, oh, I close the door on the scientist and I open the door to the citizen and I go out in the streets. So for me, it's important to be able to be a scientist advocate. I think that one of the things we don't remember is that there are there was a history of scientists doing this kind of work or doing this kind of activism, um, including in the anti-nuclear movements. Uh, so my father was part of Pugwash, which was a very important organization that worked with the military in Russia and in the US and in the UK, and they got uh, nuclear disarmament treaties signed and they got the Nobel Peace Prize for that. So they were not just sitting back and writing papers and letting it happen. They were actually calling up generals and saying, listen, we need to talk to you about how we can test this stuff, how we can get this arsenal down. You need to be on our side too, et cetera. So I think there's a real role for being an engaged scientist uh, in, our, in our history as well. We have very good examples of this. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't be intimidated and told that it's not the right thing to do. It's a very important thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. I guess many, many people here in the room and in the Zoom can relate. Um, that's a very important and inspiring thing to know. Um, yeah, we had several questions uh, regarding the so-called Goldenberg Corner and also the ways in which uh, the Western and Northern countries are doing well or doing not so well. And some folks were wondering why Sweden, Netherlands, and Denmark are doing so much worse as other countries in the global north because they are so often portrayed as the best movers. So um, is there some kind of country green washing? washing? And to put yeah. it the other way around, is there anything, what, what can we actually learn from Vietnam or from Costa Rica or from Ecuador? Does it have to do much with deindustrialization or do it, does it have to do more with degrowth or having um, Pachamama as part of the constitution? Uh, do you already have some ideas what the commonalities of the of these countries in the nice in the nice corner are? Yeah. So um, thanks for that. So I think that's really interesting. So first of all, the Netherlands and Denmark and Sweden. Um, I think that there's a lot of uh, th to some extent there's some greenwashing, and it's also like oh, if you see a few windmills, then everything is fine. But that one of the things that we're seeing is that. And so, you know, some of these countries have fairly green um, electricity production in terms of uh, carbon content, um, but there's also transport. There's also other industrial activities. I mean, the Netherlands is home to Shell and Rotterdam, literally the largest harbor in Europe, right? So that's not going to be very green, is it? <laughs> so you, you have to think about the whole, the whole industry. And when we're looking at the, this data, one of the things we're not doing is when there's a fallacy um, in uh, environmental research called the Netherlands fallacy, literally, which says if you just, everybody could be like the Netherlands, like every single country in the world could have the same population density as the Netherlands. And that's not true. The Netherlands is a very small, very densely populated country, which relies on global supply chains. So when we're looking at these indicators, we are taking international trade into account. So that's what we mean when we say resource footprints or energy footprints or carbon footprints is we're taking international trade into account and then the, 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 the levels of emissions and, and pollution and so on go up as well. So that's, that's one thing to understand. Um, and so what, what, can, what can we learn from this? I mean, I think for me, one of the, one of the things to learn is that as long as a, right now our global economy is very um, damaging and extractive and polluting, and so the higher the GDP, the higher the, a country is really going to be extracting from that global economy. Usually global, countries in the global north take money from the global south or take resources from the global south. And it's going to be, um, uh, it's going to be damaging. So we really need, really need to rethink what that global economy is doing and how we inter interact with it. What we can learn from places like Costa Rica or Vietnam or, um, or some others in, in terms of the Goldenberg Corner, so in terms, I didn't, I didn't show you the, the good news, uh, for instance, in, our, in, our, um, in the paper Nature Sustainability in 2018, which is that for each pair of indicators, so for each social indicator and environmental indicator, there was always one country that was doing good. Always one country, but it wasn't the same country. You see, if there was, if there was always the same country, then we'd all do what that country is doing, but it was never the same country. But so I think that that's actually very good news because it does tell us that there is diversity in the global system where different countries are able to do things differently. And so that means that we could aim for those kinds of things. Um, I have a PhD student right now who's uh, trying to get a paper published um, 
looking at what it takes for a country to be able to achieve high social outcomes at low resource use. And um, I'm going to just tell you the answer. The answer is public services. So the answer is equity public and public services is basically good levels of public infrastructure that help people satisfy their needs at low resource use. And that's, um, so I think that's the main thing to learn. I think Costa Rica, I, Vietnam is, is, is a, a bit more problematic. We actually wrote entire blogs on Vietnam, so I can share those with you. I can send those with you if you want. But um, Costa Rica is certainly interesting because they refuse to have an army. So they can, they can use their country's economy to deliver public services. That's what they've done very successfully. So I think that that's, in that sense, Costa Rica is indeed a good example. Mm. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. I mean, that connects very well to some other questions that um, our participants had in mind, um, especially what the, understanding, what the understanding of equity is, what does more equal actually mean, and what factors would must developing countries actually reduce for gaining a more equal world? Yeah, so equity is obviously a very uh, contested topic. Um, so in these studies, we were looking at it really from an economic perspective, but even within an economic perspective, you can have different ways of looking at what equity inequality is, right? Because you can have inequality in wealth, which is um, how much people really own in terms of assets. And for instance, if you look at wealth in the UK, you find that by the time you get to uh, the poorest segments of population, which are very often black and people of color, they have net negative wealth. They're actually mostly in debt, which is kind of terrible. Um, so, so, so wealth is one way to look at inequality. Another way is income, which is your monthly revenue. But wealthy people don't rely on monthly revenue, right? If you're really wealthy, you don't have a job with a salary, with a paycheck. You, you, just, um, you just have large, large bank accounts and lots of, own lots of stuff that you make money from, like real estate. Um, so, so wealth and income are, are very different. And um, wealth is always very much more unequally distributed than income. And then expenditure is yet a different thing. So because at the higher level of income, people spend less uh, because they have savings. So once you make a lot of money, you can actually put, put some of it aside every, every, every month or every week or whatever. Uh, so expenditure is also is always a bit more equal than income is. So you, ha you have these different levels, even when you're only looking at economic inequality. And in terms of what would change for European countries for, for being more equitable, um, there are lots of very good proposals on this because um, as Thomas Piketty has shown, so I don't know if you're, if you're familiar with his work, but I'll just type his name in the chat. Can I type his name in the chat? No, and you're, you're not, probably not gonna um, see it. I'll do. Tom, Thomas Piketty um, did something very strange for an economist. He looked at in, in inequality empirically. So he's probably one of the greatest economists of our age. Uh, and what he found was that growth contributes to growing inequality. So that under normal capital, capitalist economy, which is why he called his book Capital in the 20th Century, um, in it, the growth goes to the wealthiest. So we have two economies. We have the economy of the workers, people who get the salaries, paychecks, get an in regular income, and we have the economy of the wealthy. And for instance, Oxfam has estimated that it's something like 82% of economic growth goes to the 1%, right? So, so economic growth does not go to everybody and the wealthy are, are just skyrocketing. Like they're like the pharaohs, you know, in terms of how unequally stupidly wealthy they are. Um, and so one of the most important things one should do if one wanted to, um, or two the basic things one can do to help equity, one is a wealth tax. That's really important because um, wealth actually disintegrates democracy, right? Um, when you have people who have that much wealth and power, they're not going to let your democracy function normally. And that's one of the things you see in the US very clearly. Um, so as wealth tax, um, income tax as well, but that's less important. Um, so very strong wealth tax and also corporation tax uh, because the wealthy are also the people who own corporations. Corporations pay less than their fair share of tax. Um, and another one could be something like a universal basic income or universal basic services, where you basically say, we do not allow poverty to happen in this country. In this society, there will be no poverty. Everybody will have a minimum that corresponds to decent living. And that makes a huge difference as well. So there are basically different ways to do it. You can, you can look at the top, you can look at the bottom, you know, bring the top down, bring the bottom up. And then you can also, 
think about things that act on the middle, like health and education and other sort of uh, mechanisms there. Sorry, that was a bit of a long answer. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, thank you. But it's, it's amazing to see how um, your research gives an account of how social equality and um, yeah, good climate politi politics may go, may go together, and how the how these two how these two parts of the of the coin could act actually place place on one side, um, because very very often these um, points are played out against each other. Um, yeah. yeah, we have some yes. Yes, um, a, a question that I, being a political scientist and not an economist, find a bit tricky. Why is it always said that the most effective way is to minimize consumption instead of changing the way goods are produced? Wouldn't that be much more effective? Um, the, the problem with if you don't, um, okay, so this is this is a really interesting question. And I think that that's, there's a lot of reasons not to look at consumption. One is it's politically unpopular, that at least was the perception for a long time. Um, another one is that it's, um, you're, you're sort of intruding in people's private life according to our, our culture, right? Consumerism is king, so you don't want, there are lots of good reasons not to look at consumption. So everybody was hoping that you just change production and that's it, and then you're done. The problem is um, that the, the economy as a system does not care about that. The economy as a system, for instance, if you produce renewable energy, um, you know, the, there were studies showing that for each kilowatt hour of renewable energy produced, even more fossil fuel energy was produced or 50% more. So you're, you're in a system that is based on growth. So it's gonna grow the green stuff and it's mm -hmm. gonna grow the brown stuff. It's not actually putting them in competition, right? Um, or if you grow efficiency, I mean, this and this is what we in energy studies call the rebound effect or in a con the economy called Jevons paradox, efficient technologies in a growth as usual based economy uh, result in growth and result in growth of the whole system and result in growth in energy use and emissions. And you can model this very precisely. So um, the, the great, the great, I had the honor of being the PhD supervisor. I mean, I, I would say this, but he's really great. Uh, who's the, 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 the best um, modern scholar on rebound effect and that's Paul Brockway. So I look, I encourage you to look up his papers because he really goes, he's built these models where he shows, look, efficiency drives growth in the economy and efficiency drives growth in resource use and emissions. And we need to take, we need to understand that you can't just make one thing more efficient. And there are various classic examples of the rebound effect like car technology is so much more efficient than it used to be. Like my old parents' car, when I was a child, it was like this tiny little French thing and it was clunky and whatever, mega inefficient. Now cars are much more efficient in terms of each unit but each unit has translated into an SUV. So you use these advanced materials, you use these advanced technologies to make a big car that people are gonna drive for further. So the efficiency does not translate into using less. So there are all kinds of political economy mechanisms in fact, whereby individual measures to try to substitute for fossil fuels or to reduce their use through efficiency translate to higher use. And that's what we really need to stop. And the only way to stop that is through dealing with full frontally with consumption. What do we need consumption for? How do we do it more efficiently? How do we stop <laughs> when enough is enough? Like we need to really ask that question. And that's in a question that obviously um, is not fondly considered by capitalism or lots of different private sectors. Um, but I think it's really the, the central question of our time. The longer we don't look at it, the harder the answer becomes. So mm. I think it's time to look at it. Yeah, and actually your research shows that we don't talk about going back to the Stone Age, but to lifestyles of the 1960s, which were pretty comfortable, I would say, um, if I had already born, been born in that age, of course. Um, yeah, we had also several people wondering a bit more about the parameters yeah, that your research is um, grounded on. And um, while I would encourage everyone to read the papers, it would be great if you could give some more information on that. So um, somebody, somebody was wondering whether the transport sector really has a bigger impact on carbon emissions than the food sector, especially regarding animal mm -hmm. and especially regarding yeah. animal and diary products. Um, and yeah. others were, were also wondering whether you included habitat fragmentation and biodiversity loss in the in the research and how that may come in as a as a factor. 
I'm not sure if I was understandable, if there was some kind yeah, of- Yeah, yeah, no, um, that, that's fine. Yeah, okay. so um, so I had to focus, so I think the research framework, so the, the sort of picture with the, the bubbles um, in terms of biophysical resources all the way to well-being, I think that that could be applied to things like land use, biodiversity, and so on. And we, I did some research um, looking at diets uh, as well at some point. So, so I think there is, a, and there's also there's a lot of other evidence out there. So, but in terms of the focus of my research, it's on energy and it's technical energy, and um, uh, that means also uh, mostly CO two emissions. So I don't look at uh, the greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, which are non-CO2 mostly. They're um, nitrous oxides and methane and the land use from that and the biodiversity impacts from that. However, the consensus of research, so um, transport, um, I'm, I might get the numbers wrong, but I think that transport worldwide is still more emissions um, depending on how you, you, you estimate them than uh, agriculture. They're roughly at the same level. I think they're about a quarter each, uh, but I would have to go to go and look to be sure. So they're, they're roughly the same. Um, I think transport's a bit bigger is my recollection. And, uh, and so, and the biggest, but the biggest is, is electricity and heat. Um, so, uh, so agriculture is obviously very important and um, uh, meat-based agriculture, such as is popular in Germany, I'm sure, is, uh, if I remember, I, I couldn't get lentil soup without lard in it, um, or bacon or whatever, but uh, the, 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 the is, is a big problem, right? So anything that has to do with red meat, uh, whether it's cows or sheep or uh, pigs, is going to be much more inefficient than uh, a plant-based diet. And so that's one of the things to really to really take into account. But the, the research there is is overwhelming. So there's all this research, uh, not by me, but that's that's shown that um, that plant based diets are both healthier. So there was the Eat Lancet Commission are both healthier and more sustainable and give land back for biodiversity. I mean, because that's a big, big problem right now is about half of our edible crops we're feeding to animals. So we're growing all these edible crops and then we're feeding it to, to animals and then, we, you know, it's a from, a, from an efficiency perspective, I don't, you know, from a humane perspective, it's not great, but from an efficiency perspective, it's terrible. So there are a lot more efficient ways and more sustainable ways and healthier ways to feed people. Mm. So that's, uh, I think that that's the, the, the clear message as far as diets are concerned. And diets are a hot topic. I mean, they're very uncomfortable to talk about because again, it has to do with the private sphere, right? The, how yeah, dare you- Yeah, it's private food. sphere, yeah. I'm sorry? <laughs> What did you say, yeah. Francisca? Um, yeah, I guess everybody understands pri private sphere and yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, so it, it's just it's just hard. I mean, I had a student get up and walk out of a class once because he was like, "Right, right, you can take my car, but you cannot take my food." And I was just like, I was just I wasn't telling anybody what to do. I was just like, "This is the evidence of what these things do," and it, it really taught me something in the sense that this is something that people people have very strong emotional attachment to food. Um, so it, it doesn't, it doesn't make it easy, but I think, again, it's a conversation we need to have, you know, it just because something is hard and emotion has an emotional attachment doesn't mean we don't get to talk about it. Um, mm. that's life. That's reality. Yeah. And I, and I guess that, um, generational change, um, does a lot to that question, even though, um, it's very, it's a very sensitive one. And I would assume that, um, I mean, many of the people who are listening right now are in their twenties. And I guess that the number of veggies and vegans is much higher than in the, um, yeah. in, in the people over 40 or in the professor, professorial range or so. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, um, maybe as, maybe as a last question, um, maybe as the number one question that everybody um, may always have, um, of course, um, somebody was asking whether um, real change and an effective fight against the climate crisis was only possible through a system change or via a system transformation, which is, of course, the big and huge question that What's the, how always you stands to System boom. change and system transformation, they're both, they're both, they're both changes. Mm. Um, but you, I guess, is it a question between gradual change or... So I didn't. I guess I didn't understand the question. But what is the? How do you differentiate system change and system transformation? 
Um, well, it's well. Um, well, I don't know who posed the question, but I guess a system change is um, considered to be the more rapid change than um, a system transformation by okay. social learning and so on. But then taking, of course, much more time. Okay, I guess I would I would say it more in terms of because what we're the the words we're discussing, for instance, within the IPCC are transition, mm -hmm. which is this smooth, gradual. You know, you tweak the price, you tweak the carbon, carbon price, or whatever. You get a smooth transition as opposed to a transformation, which is just like, let's get, let's, let's go. Let's just, let's just get it done. We're going to transform things. It's not going to be the same. So um, I think that at this point, uh, the IPCC has been pretty clear that transformation is necessary. So that's already since um, in some, yeah. So I think that transformation is the, is the con scientific consensus. If we want to commit safe within any kind of temperatures regarded as um, safe, I mean, 1.5 degrees isn't safe. People have already died. Species have already gone extinct. Uh, entire lands are already going to end up underwater. So, you know, it's not safe, but it's a heck of a lot safer than where we're headed now. And I think that we don't get away from that without transformation. I think the question now is how fast we're going to be able to succeed. The longer it takes, the worse things will be. Um, and things can get very, very grim indeed. I mean, we're we're, I, I don't believe that it's possible to have organized human civilization at three degrees by 2100. We're really destroying the, we're cutting, we're cutting down the, 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 the stable basis for agriculture. And that's, I don't see how we deal with that. So, um, so yeah, so I think that trans, I think transformation is necessary. Um, yeah, that's, I don't, I don't think that there, that's an open question anymore. Um, is there any hope that you would also put in technology um, yeah. or, or, or rather not? I mean, there's, of course, a very hot topic on geoengineering, um, carbon capture and storage and many other issues. But um, I guess maybe you have completely different Not those technologies. Yeah. So technologies I'm very excited about. Lentils, I'm excited about. Hmm. Um, but uh, other technology, you know, so, so there, there are other, there's other technologies in terms of, so dietary, diet in terms of diet, there are uh, interesting things on the on the horizon, um, but in terms of uh, more in terms of like how you create plant based foods that are sustainable and and, and tasty and so on, uh, but they are already uh, housing retrofit. As I'm looking at my old windows, is a very important technology here. So housing retrofit is essential. We really need to be designing houses and settlements to allow uh, low energy use. Right. So that's the thing. So those, those kinds of technological changes. In terms of geoengineering, even the biggest fans of geoengineering admit that, you know, even if you manage to do things like stop the, the heating a bit, for instance, through interfering with the atmosphere, you're not going to stop ocean acidification, which is already uh, killing shellfish around the world, which is already just, you know, it's one of the causes, like ocean, a lot of the CO2 ends up in the, that we put into the atmosphere ends up absorbed in the ocean and it's acidifying the ocean to the extent where shellfish are disintegrating. Like we are changing the chemistry, not just of the atmosphere, but of the ocean in a way that is dangerous to life. And there's no geoengineering fix to that. So that's already a huge problem. If we kill life on the, in the ocean, uh, which we're doing, we're also gonna stop the ocean's ability to uh, durably absorb carbon you know, because it's, it's absorbed and fixed by plankton and so on. So, so we're, I don't think that anybody has great hopes for geoengineering. It's like, it's like a bandaid. It's buying you a few years here and there, um, sort of delaying some major impacts. It is not a long-term solution. The long-term solution is going to zero emissions. And so the faster we do that, the better off we are um, because all of these things are risky and, and ca carbon, carbon capture, carbon direct storage or whatever, whatever the, the thing is, it, it, a lot of that is um, in some ways possible, in some ways necessary, because we might need to do some of that anyway. But at scale, it's completely unproven. It's very expensive. By itself, it's very energy intensive. So we're not, you know, the infrastructure it requires is a whole other thing. So it's risky. It's a completely risky proposition in terms of the scale of the technology, in terms of the expense, in terms of the deployment. You don't put your eggs in that basket if you've got, you know, if you've got seven, eight, nine billion people to take care of, it's completely irresponsible. Mm -hmm. So that's really something that needs to that needs to to, um, to change in the way we we think about this. We really need to be thinking much more in that what is safe to do, and what is safe to do is to provide efficient technologies for people to live decent lives, 
while we ramp down energy use for now. That's safe. Mm. But this other stuff is not. Yeah, yeah, th th thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think you gave us a very good plan on how to go ahead with such issues and also how to, um, yeah, stay rebel, but also stay, stay scientists or become scientists. Um, I think that was a very, very inspiring talk for everybody listening right here. And I guess we are, I mean, at the moment we have been, I think more than 900 people listening to your, to your talk and your presentation, which is amazing. Um, yeah, we're all very thankful for having you here and for answering all that bunch of um, questions to each and every direction. Um, yeah, um, I, ho I hope that, that you all, um, that you all enjoy, enjoy the evening. The, um, talk will be on YouTube, YouTube streams, YouTube streams soon. Um, and uh, yeah, we will, we will um, put the stream also, also in open all out. And um, yeah, we were very thankful for having you here. And um, yeah, wish you all the best with the IPCC report and um, with all of your future work. And um, yeah. Be All right. Thank, thank you so much. Thanks for all of you. I'm sorry I didn't answer all the questions. You have my email address. I'm easy to find on the internet. And uh, I look forward to, to hearing from you. So thanks so much for being there and enjoy beautiful Germany. Have a good rest of the week. Yeah, we will. Um, thank you so much. Um, if you want, you may stay with us for a quick debriefing afterwards, which won't take, which won't take long. Um, we'll be part of a separate Zoom room. Um, which I'll just send around. Thank you. Okay. Um, bye to everybody. Good luck with the exam, and we'll see you. We'll see you next week again.